This video is brought to you by Skillshare. Hey there interwebs, I hope you're doing well. Today, we're gonna be talking about a controversy around a really troubling letter signed by one of the most controversial figures within the transgender community. I'm speaking about, of course, Buck Angel. Oh boy, a trans woman talking about Buck Angel on YouTube. I'm sure this is gonna go over great. For those of you who don't know, Buck Angel is a trans man famous for his work as a porn star, as well as his work as a sex positivity and trans activist. He arguably was one of the most famous trans men in the world in the early 2000s, featured everywhere from HBO to Huffington Post. However, as I said, he's also an incredibly controversial figure for many trans folks, and I'm tipping my hand here a little bit, a deeply harmful one for numerous reasons, not the least of which is his outing of the Matrix director Lana Wachowski as transgender for revenge, as well as his transmedicalist, misogynistic, and envy-phobic views, which, if you don't know what any of those terms mean, we're going to be talking about them in just a little bit. But we're talking about Buck Angel today because he recently signed Trans Men Fight Back, which, despite sounding like the title of an awesome revenge thriller movie I would totally watch, someone please get on that, Maybe I should get on that. Anyways, instead of that, it's actually a letter hosted and signed by the founders of Gender Dysphoria Alliance Canada and Trans Educational Voices, two similarly controversial trans man-run organizations. And again, we'll be talking about why they're controversial in just a bit. But this letter, whoo boy, uh, it's a lot of fun. And by fun, I mean not fun in the slightest. Basically, the letter claims that trans women as an entire group are attacking and abusing trans men as an entire group, and the trans community as a whole. But in reality though, this letter uses disproven scientific theories and transphobic narratives to make its vague and deliberately misleading accusations. Even further, with it being signed by someone as well known as Buck Angel, it misleadingly reinforces and intentionally leans into transphobic framings currently being wielded by harmful anti-trans hate groups like TERFs or the alt-right, as well as a long-standing history of harmful stereotypes of trans women as deceptive and violent and mentally ill, all done in order to justify its further attack on trans women specifically and trans rights as a whole. So for today's video, I want to take this letter not just to talk about why it's harmful and pushing really transphobic ideas and narratives, but also use it as a way to discuss the history of discriminatization and stigmatization of trans women as a whole. Then we're gonna broaden out and talk about the context of this letter, not only within history and how that feeds into today, and not only with the letter itself, but why the narrative that this letter feeds into is directly and intentionally supporting the dogma of anti-transgender hate groups like TERFs and the alt-right. Also, just to point out, as is the case with all of my videos, the goal here isn't to tear down or attack someone else. While I find a lot of Buck Angels and other folks we'll be talking about in this video's views harmful, the goal here is to explain where these views come from and why they are harmful, not to attack or put down a specific person. That's all on the docket today. It's gonna be fun, I go, uh, educational, I hope is, is, the, is the right term to use. But let's start by getting into the letter. And to get into the letter, we first need to break down how it frames its discussion right from the start with transphobic history. So, let's get into it. But before we get into the fun topic of transphobia, uh, let's take a break and talk about something that's actually fun. This video's sponsor, Skillshare. Skillshare is an online learning community with thousands of inspiring classes for creators where you can explore new skills, learn how to better approach your passions, and build your creativity. Now, I get a ton of messages from all of you nerds out there asking me for advice on how to build your sci-fi worlds and, and universes. I mean, me too. I love creative writing, and I definitely understand wanting to build your own world that uh, isn't this one from time to time? And that's why I really loved Lincoln Michelle's class, Science Fiction and Fantasy, Creating Unique and Powerful Worlds. Lincoln in this class does such an amazing job breaking down how to do world building on both a big and small scale and makes you like really think about the little intricacies of everything that you do when you're actually creating your own distinct universe. And he actually gives a ton of like really useful and specific writing tips that are actually like something that you can physically do when writing, which is extremely helpful for me who someone gets a lot of anxiety when I come sit down to write and like don't know what to do when I'm looking at a blank page. He actually gives you something to like actually work on and progress through and it's it's true truly, truly amazing class. I cannot recommend it enough, especially if you're if you're a creative writer. Plus, like, his thumbnail for the class literally had both Star Trek the Animated Series and the Hobbit animated movie images in it, so I literally had no choice but to stand this class. The greatest adventure is what lies on Skillshare. If any of you got that reference, I adore you and love you. You're the best. 
But regardless, I'm sure no matter what, Skillshare will have a class for you. It's curated specifically for learning, meaning there are no ads and there are always new premium classes being offered so you can stay focused and keep finding new ways to expand your creativity. And the first 1,000 of my subscribers to click the link below in the description will get a one month free trial of premium membership. So like, what are you waiting for? It's the, it's the greatest adventure and all that. Like, come on, I did an animated Hobbit reference, anybody? And, and okay, maybe it was just for me, but regardless, uh, thank you so much to this video sponsor, Skillshare. I really appreciate it, but sadly, that does mean it's time to get to the less fun topic. The greatest adventure is breaking down transphobia. Yay. <laughs> Joy. Transgender politics have taken a troubling turn in recent years, which most people, including many transgender people themselves, are completely oblivious to. Gender identity disorder, now called gender dysphoria, used to be talked about quite openly in the LGB community, and whether or not we as lay people knew about Dr. Blanchard's typography, clinicians understood that there were at least two different kinds of GD. Homosexual type, which many lesbian and gay people experience and integrate into a gay or lesbian identity. Autogynephilia, which only inflicts heterosexual men. It's a paraphilia in which a heterosexual orientation is inverted in such a way that the object of sexual desire is oneself as female. So we're already only a few lines into this letter, and already we're seeing them frame the conversation with harmful misinformation, centering the discussion around two disproven categorizations of transness, a homosexual categorization and an autogynephilic categorization. So to understand why these two framings of transness are harmful, we need to get back into some history. Up until the swinging 1980s, the decade where the underappreciated fanny packs were still considered fashionable, as well they should have been, hashtag bring back the fanny, the understanding of transness and sexuality was extremely gender essentialist, even more so than today. For example, women were thought to naturally only be attracted to men, and vice versa. Anything that was considered deviant from that, i.e. homosexuality, was seen to be some sort of biological or pathological issue. Gay men, for example, were seen as having feminized brains and therefore more naturally effeminate and explaining why they liked other men. The same thing for lesbians and their masculine brains and butch expressions. Under this framing, homosexuality was viewed as a pathological issue that needed treatment, that it was some sort of mental illness. And this led to many harmful stereotypes, narratives, attempts at treatment, and stigmatization of the LGBTQ community as a whole. And we'll touch upon some of those a little bit later on. But this is partially why you'll hear the stigma of gay folks as mentally ill to this day. Now, that's also contingent on a few other things, but this is a large reason of it, that mental health professionals actually did view gay folks and homosexuality as a mental health issue. The APA didn't remove homosexuality from the DSM until 1987, and the WHO, the World Health Organization, didn't remove it until 1992. But obviously today, we more commonly know and understand that homosexuality is just a natural part of the variations of humanity, and that it's okay for anyone to just be, it's not a mental health issue. And similarly, that one's sexual orientation doesn't make someone more or less feminine or masculine. It has really nothing to do with it. Your gender expression and your sexual orientation are completely separate, as is your gender identity, but we'll talk about that in a second. Because this pathologized conceptualization of LGBTQ identities didn't just stop at sexual orientation, but extended to trans people as well. Trans people, known as transsexuals at the time, were considered to just be homosexuals who had just had a different outcome. Trans women were just gay men who liked to put on those women's clothes, and trans men were just gay men who liked to dress masculinely. Also, I don't know, I don't know what, I, I was trying to like hold the suspender, but I kind of just grabbed my bra, I, I don't know what I was doing. We're moving on. So this whole idea was that someone's sexual orientation, which, as I said, was seen as a mental health issue, was the reason for transness. And as such, transness was also considered an inherently mental health issue. In fact, one that was even considered to be more of a mental health problem than homosexuality itself. Just layering the gay on top of each other. However, this framing quite obviously has a lot of issues considering what we know today. Firstly, we know that gender and sexual orientation aren't intrinsically linked. The type of person that someone wants to bone or kiss or make out with or have a romantic connection with isn't really dependent on what gender you are. 
It can inform it in some ways, it can inform what you like during sex and romance and how you interact with each other, but your sexual orientation doesn't necessarily depend on what gender you are. Even more so, this whole idea doesn't even account for bisexuality, but bisexuality was rarely considered to even be a real thing back then. Even to this day, there's that stigma around bisexual people that were just haven't chosen a side or something like that. But further, if we look at this homosexual idea of transness within the trans community, how do you account for bisexual or heterosexual trans men? Those trans men who are attracted to women. For example, a 2015 survey found that 23% of trans men were straight and 12% were bisexual. Therefore, trans men who like women. The same argument could be made for trans women attracted to men. Even further, even regardless of the trans part of it, a study found that at least one-fourth of men and women, regardless of if they're trans or not, had fantasized at least once about cross-dressing. So obviously, because it was an incorrect theory, psychologists started to see flaws in this framing of the homosexual type of transness in the 1980s, particularly when they studied trans women, who were the most studied population of trans people at the time often completely ignoring trans men. Yet instead of doing what science should do and go back to base assumptions and maybe try to redefine the understanding of transness and homosexuality as a mental health issue, psychologist Dr. Blouchard doubled down on conceptualizing transness as linked to sexual orientation. In order to try to justify why some trans women might also be attracted to other women, he theorized that there was a subset of trans women called autogynophiles, trans women who got aroused by the thought of themselves as women of themselves being in a woman's body. He'd argued that these trans women weren't homosexual, but were instead the result of, quote, misdirected heterosexual drives, whatever that means. Basically, it was the idea that these autogynophilic trans women were just straight men who got their wires crossed somewhere and only got aroused by thinking of themselves in a woman's body instead of just being attracted to women. And by the way, it's important to note with this theory that Dr. Blanchard argued that only trans women were autogynophilic. Trans men, again, need not apply. Now, obviously, just like the homosexual type, because it's based off of an incorrect assumption, autogynophilia is just as inaccurate. And we know this more by stuff that we've learned more and more about transness today. Yes, there are trans women who get aroused at the idea of having sex in a body of a woman. I'm one of them. I kind of like to think of myself boning as a girl. But you see, that arousal doesn't come from me or other trans women getting aroused at the very idea of us as women, the, the body of a woman, but the idea of us being in a body that makes us comfortable enough to feel sexy in. Back before I transitioned, I never thought of myself as sexy. I, I saw myself as this disgusting, gross thing, even though I had people around me who told me that I was sexy. But after transitioning, I actually feel sexy in how I look. I feel sexy in my body. And feeling sexy in your own body kind of helps with the boinky boink times. I mean, I would put money down right now that many of you folks watching this video who aren't trans like to have the boinky boink. And I'm sure some of you felt like, oh yeah, I'm sexy. I look good in this outfit. And I'm sure that that feeling helped put fuel in your tank for the sexy times. On top of that, there's also evidence that proves that this idea of autogynophilia isn't dependent on transness. One study found that cisgender women, i.e. non-transgender women, experience arousal at the idea of themselves in a female body comparable to what Blanchard found in trans women. In fact, another study found that 93% of cis women experience that feeling at least to some degree, with 28% experiencing it at high levels. Even further, nearly a third of human beings, male, female, trans, or not, fantasize about trading bodies with someone of the other sex. I mean, how else do you explain why the movie She's the Man ever got made? So while yes, some trans women, like myself, do get attracted to the idea of ourselves in women's bodies, that's not exclusive to trans people, nor is it the cause of our transness. Yet, despite these clear inaccuracies, these misinformed theories remain prevalent for a long time in medical communities given the lack of understanding of transness and lack of study of trans people at the time, leading many trans folks, including Buck Angel himself, to understand their transness this way. In fact, this is how Buck Angel and the other trans men who signed this letters see themselves, as they state in the letter, quote, Some of us have chosen to live as the opposite sex for our comfort. This idea of transness being an inherent mental illness has only recently started to fade away with the medical community getting better research and study of trans people. For example, it was only in 2015 that the APA reaffirmed that transgender individuals were not a mental health disorder inherently and reaffirmed it just this year, stating, quote, that they recognize that descriptions of any gender identity or expression as a natural, abhorrent, or unhealthy perpetuate stigma for sexual and gender minorities and have negative mental health and social consequences. 
But even as this idea in the medical community has fallen away, the idea of autogynephilia continued to gain traction in mainstream culture once they were popularized in the early 2000s by two authors. One, self-identified autogynephilic trans woman Anne Lawrence, and two, pop science author J. Michael Bailey. And so these theories started to spread and become the mainstream understanding of transness overall. But we're going to come back to the propagation of and the usage of the theory of autogonophilia as it appears today in just a bit. But let's get back to the letter itself. So we already see that Buck Angel's letter begins with this framing of two incorrect theories of transness, that most trans women are autogynophiles, or as the letter misgenderingly states us, AGP males. And I say that this was done intentionally because this entire letter hinges upon this framing of trans women. It wants to frame autogynophilic trans women, which they argue in the letter are the most vocal members of the trans community, as malicious in intent. As many clinicians and community members such as ourselves have observed, most of the people at the forefront of trans activism are those heterosexual males with AGP, which they don't want anyone to know. As trans men, we wish to step forward and expose this because those AGP males, trans women, have abused and silenced us for years in order to control the narrative. As trans men, we wish to step forward and expose this because those AGP males, trans men, have abused and silenced us for years in order to control the narrative. This part of the letter argues that trans women dominate the discussion around trans people. And to a degree, there is a kernel of truth in this. It is true that trans women are often overrepresented in discussions of the trans community for a myriad of reasons. One, for example, and probably most relevant to this discussion, is that trans women are often seen as objects of fascination over trans men, because we as trans women are seen as inherently sexual objects worthy of being looked at. You see, society already views feminine bodies, regardless of if they're trans or not, as something to be ogled at and objectified. That's what we see with the idea of the male gaze in cinema, for example. But this idea that trans women bodies are objects to be ogled at is further compounded by the popularization of the autogynephilic theory. Because due to its framing of trans women as getting turned on by our bodies, it suggests that our bodies are inherently sexual that our bodies are basically just walking sex toys for ourselves and for others. Thus, trans women's bodies becomes not only objects of fascination, but inherently sexual. These assumptions that trans women are inherently sexually promiscuous, sexually deceptive, sexually deviant, and sexually motivated in our transitions persist in what are perhaps the three most common trans women archetypes seen in the media over the years. The gay man who transitions to female in order to seduce unsuspecting straight men. The male pervert who transitions to female in order to fulfill some kind of bizarre sex fantasy. And the overrepresentation of trans women as sex workers. In sharp contrast, transsexual men are not typically portrayed in a hypersexualized manner, nor are they depicted as being sexually motivated in their transitions. Instead, the most common ulterior motive projected onto trans men is that they transition in order to obtain male privilege. Because women are viewed as the lesser sex in our culture, people often don't understand why anyone would give up being a man in order to become a relatively disempowered woman. So they assume that trans women transition in order to obtain the one type of power that women are perceived as having in our society, the ability to be sexualized and to be the object of heterosexual male desire. Thus, the hypersexualization of trans women and our motives for transitionings merely reflects the implicit cultural assumption that women as a whole have no value beyond our ability to be sexualized. Now, this is just one of many reasons that trans women are often more overrepresented than trans men. But for our discussion, autogynephilia leading to trans women being seen as inherently sexual is perhaps the most important one to keep in mind for this discussion, as we'll see later on in this letter. But this letter frames that fact as if trans women are the ones intentionally doing that, and that we're doing it in order to push trans men and other women down. Just like my shoulder strap fell down. Look how smooth I am. I got this. I got this. I know, I know how to YouTube, I say as I totally distract from the point. But this idea is basically saying that we're actively trying to abuse and silence trans men. That's at least what the letter states. Yet the letter never really gives any evidence of that. But the letter does go on to state ways in which they believe that trans women are controlling the narrative about trans people in general. For example, take this next quote in the letter. As trans men, we wish to step forward and expose this because those AGP males, have abused and silenced us for years in order to control the narrative. 
they are behind the gender identity narrative because that hides AGP. Dear God. God, whose words are these? I'm just, I do not believe these things. Sorry, Jesse. All right, let me pick up. Because of this letter's incredibly disdainful tone, as well as the quotes around gender identity, we can see that the letter inherently believes that this idea of gender identity is a manipulation on the part of trans women. And given the framing of this letter as a whole, it's hard not to see why. As I said, the letter starts from this outdated idea that transness is something pathological, a mental illness requiring treatment. And today, this idea has morphed into what is known as transmedicalism. The idea that being trans is contingent upon gender dysphoria, a distress at your body that requires medical treatment like hormones or surgeries. Buck Angel and the other signers of this letter are major believers in this, by the way. Buck Angel has repeatedly stated this on numerous different interviews and discussions and on Twitter, and the signers of this letter are part of the groups that I mentioned earlier that have stated that this is the requirement for being trans in their own mission statements. Even further though, another problem with transmedicalism is that it often requires that trans folks be binary identified, that you must desire to be the opposite sex. Now, this idea of transmedicalism is not how many scientists, psychologists, doctors, and many more understand transness today, which we see today as simply identifying as a gender other than the one that you were assigned at birth. For example, I was born with a penis and therefore assigned the gender of boy at birth. Therefore, I am trans because I display myself and identify in a different way than I was told I was at birth. Now, the reasons that someone may identify as something other than what they were assigned at birth may be because of gender dysphoria, as was the case for me, and things like surgery and hormones can help alleviate that dysphoria. Like, again, it did for me. But that distress can also be alleviated simply through using different pronouns or wearing certain clothing or just talking to a therapist. Some people who experience gender dysphoria have no need for expensive and bureaucracy requiring surgeries. The things that transmedicalism would say are required for being trans. Also, gender dysphoria as a whole isn't a requirement for being trans. Sometimes being trans just means you have gender euphoria, a happiness at anything from getting those surgeries to using different pronouns that align with a gender that you feel you're more comfortable in that isn't the one that you were assigned at birth. Or sometimes being trans just means you want to exist in a way that you're just comfortable with that doesn't necessarily align with how society tells you you have to be because of how you were assigned at birth. This is the quote gender identity narrative that this letter is referring to. And it's one by the way that is backed up by numerous science and studies. On top of this though, as I said, transmedicalism often erases non-binary identities. Trans people who don't identify as boys or girls, but something else, whether that be demigirl, demiboy, non-binary just as a thing, gender queer, gender fluid, anything like that. But not only does transmedicalism erase these identities, saying that they aren't valid, that they don't exist, that because they don't fit into this pathologized framing, but often it actively encourages stigmatization of non-binary folks, saying that non-binary folks are just faking, that they're making things up, an idea that we'll see crop up in just a little bit again later on. But we clearly see that this is the case with someone like Buck Angel, who has repeatedly mocked non-binary people's identities online. So we can see a clear line between transmedicalism as an idea and how it results in discrimination against non-binary people. Transmedicalism erases all of these identities that aren't contingent upon gender dysphoria, and often even further erases those who experience gender dysphoria but don't need surgeries or hormones to alleviate it. Yet instead of looking at that science and those studies, the letter instead ascribes malicious intent to the very concept of gender identity and states that it was created by trans women as an attempt to hide our autogynophilia, to hide our strange sexual deviancy in their eyes. And the reason the letter does this, that it has that framing, is twofold. First, these pathologized concepts of gender, the homosexual type and the autogynophilic type, were the prevailing ones until very, very recently. And as a result, folks like Buck Angel, who come from a slightly older generation of trans people than myself, were told that this was the way to conceptualize themselves. It's really hard to change a narrative about yourself that you've been told to believe your entire life, one that was told to you by professionals and people of authority above you. Yet that doesn't really explain why they believe that trans women are maliciously trying to push that theory. The malicious intent ascribed to trans women comes out of a stigma that was created with the theory of autogynophilia. You see, until recently, because of this theory of autogynophilia, trans women were thought to be mentally ill. And therefore, when we claimed that we weren't autogynophiles, correctly by the way, instead we were seen as either incapable of understanding our mental health because we were mentally ill, or that we were misreporting or in denial about it, or more often the case, it was argued that we were liars. That we were actively trying to deceive others to try to trick them. 
that we were trying to lie about our autogynophilia because we don't want others to find out about our sexual fetish that autogynophilia implies about us. But as I said, this is patently untrue. Again, I like having sex, but me being trans has nothing to do with my sexual desires. I feel better and more comfortable having sex now that I've transitioned, but the very fact that I'm trans isn't what gets me turned on. But trans women are consistently framed as deceptive and manipulative, and that is what this letter is leaning into. And so we see that the writers of this letter basically have two false assumptions, that trans women are inherently deceptive and that gender identity is inaccurate. I mean, if we're inherently deceptive and gender identity isn't real, I mean, it kind of naturally follows that you would think that trans women, the liars, are the ones trying to push this lying concept of gender identity. Even though, again, gender identity is backed up by science and trans women as liars is just a stereotype and stigmatization against trans women. But this idea of us intentionally being deceitful for our own gain frames the entire letter. The letter goes on to describe every single idea about the trans community that's come out over the past few years that's gotten pushback from anti-transgender groups as somehow being an intentional deceit by trans women. Children are being taught a false narrative in the media and in public schools, which is confusing them, in order to protect the egos, fantasies, and capitalist desires of AGP males. They are also behind the erasure of women's spaces and women's language. Most of us with the homosexual type GD are fully aware of our biological reality, though some of us have chosen to live as the opposite sex for our comfort. And they are behind the transhumanist agenda. Now, I'm not going to break down each one of these accusations that this letter is going on about, cause we'd be here all day, but they're all leaning into these false narratives that are pushed by transphobes and saying that these things are caused by trans women, that trans women are trying to hurt people, that we're trying to trans the children, that we're just trying to get money, that we're just trying to get sex from women or men around us. These are all things that have been proven untrue by endless research and study, and I've also done videos on many of these things, and I'll link them down below, and for things that I don't have linked down below that I've made, I'll link to other YouTubers that have also done videos on these topics. But all that being said, I do want to point our attention before we finish up on one claim that I find to be very telling, as they state that trans women are behind trying to ban conversion therapy. They are behind the conversion therapy bans, because AGP is a sexual orientation that likely can't be changed through talk therapy, unlike the homosexual subtype, which is best understood as a developmental stage for many LGB people. Most children with this type of GD resolve it as they become adult gay slash lesbians. Only a tiny percentage don't, complicated by things such as homophobia. Developmental psychotherapy can help resolve that. When AGP males control the narrative, banning all psychotherapy for quote, gender identity, they are denying those of us with the other types of GD options for appropriate treatment, leaving us with medicalization as the only legal option. I find this accusation that trans women are the ones behind the push to ban conversion therapy to be quite telling about this ideology that this letter is trying to push. Because as I've said numerous times, these trans men see their transness as a sort of mental illness. And so as a result, they believe that conversion therapy, which is a harmful practice still not completely outlawed today, which tries to force homosexual people to try to change their sexual orientation, can help. Conversion therapy starts on the basis that LGBTQ people are mentally ill and can be fixed. But conversion therapy is proven not to work. You can't change someone's sexuality or gender identity because that's just part of who they are. It's who they are as a person. In fact, it's often quite dangerous to try to put someone through conversion therapy. About 7% of the LGBTQ community in the US, for example, have been proven to be twice as likely to attempt suicide because they've gone through that therapy because they've been told to believe themselves as wrong or sick, but are unable to stop themselves from being gay or trans because that's who they are. We are indeed trying to stop conversion therapy from happening, but not by ourselves and not without good reason. There is a large community of LGBTQ people and our allies pushing to ban the horrible and damaging practice of conversion therapy. The writers of the letter also claim that trans women's bans on the conversion therapy leave medicalization as the only option to treat gender dysphoria. But as I already stated, that's actually what they say as trans medicalists. For them, it's either harmful conversion therapy to attempt to erase your transness or get surgical treatments if you have gender dysphoria. But trans folks who argue for better understanding of gender identity actually argue that surgeries are only one of numerous options to help someone suffering from gender dysphoria, including, you know, regular affirming therapy. 
But you can see how conversion therapy bases itself on the idea that LGBTQ in any form is inherently a mental illness to be fixed, instead of it just being an okay and fine thing for someone to be. And so, of course, the writers of this letter who view transness as also similarly pathological in nature would similarly support the horrible practice of conversion therapy. If this narrative weren't so harmful, I would almost find it pitiable, as I do feel some level of pity for other LGBTQ folks who try to push or accept conversion therapy, even to the detriment of their own health and those of others. Throughout this letter, time and time again, the writer's conceptualization of trans women as autogynophiles, a uh, sickness and a sexual deviancy, ends up being used to justify harmful practices or ignoring science in favor of narratives that fit this conceptualized idea of themselves as mentally ill. And this mixes with the idea of trans women as inherently devious and sexually deviant to show that we are manipulating and trying to harm them, trying to attack them and the trans community as a whole. By controlling the narrative to hide their own condition, because their sexual fantasy only works if uninterrupted, they've also hidden evidence-based information from everyone with the other types of GD. By branding it all as trans, young people with homosexual GD aren't being told anything about the specific condition they have. That is, information we are entitled to, which makes a difference in our identity formation, our mental health, and our choices about what treatment options we want. When in reality, all we and other trans folks and our allies are trying to do is advocate for our own safety and the safety of others, as well as trying to discuss science as it is and trying to fight for our rights. They also claim that trans women are hiding other options for those suffering from gender dysphoria to force them into irreversible surgeries, which we're not. I've already stated numerous times in this video that many trans folks support everything from surgeries to therapy to simply affirming someone's gender by using different pronouns or wearing clothes that suit someone's gender identity as part of a multitude of options to help folks suffering from gender dysphoria. We're not trying to force surgeries on anyone, but also try to make sure folks who do need surgeries understand what it can do and fight to make it readily available for those who need it, as opposed to trying to stop access to all trans affirming healthcare altogether like many transphobic groups have worked to do over the past few years, which we'll talk about in just a little bit. But the letter goes on to even imply that trans women are deliberately ignorant of science ourselves. Most of us with the homosexual type GD are fully aware of our biological reality, though some of us have chosen to live as the opposite sex for our comfort. The implication here in this sentence is that trans women either are not aware of our biology or, again, are lying about it. I've said this millions of times before, but trans women are not unaware of our biology. There's this transphobic narrative that trans people are somehow blind to the idea of science and biology. No, in fact, quite the opposite. Trans women are not claiming to be biological women. Honestly, it kind of blows my mind that people think that. Why do you think some of us in the trans community get surgeries or hormones in the first place? Because we are aware of our biology, but we're also aware of what makes us happy and comfortable too. And surgeries and hormones are available tools that we have today that can make us happier. We're not ignorant of our biology. In fact, our decisions are very much informed by it. The only time that trans women may hide the fact that they're trans often is typically out of safety, so that we don't get attacked or beaten or discriminated against for being trans. Understandable considering the rise in anti-transgender hate crimes and murders over the past few years, as well as the discrimination that trans people have always faced in things like housing, mental health, medical health, job opportunities, and many more. And honestly, I kind of find this implication that this letter has that we ignore science funny in the light of all the research that this letter has to ignore to even create this transphobic framing in the first place. All that being said, let's talk about how this letter ends. As transgender people with homosexual gender dysphoria, we are finally taking a stand. We are speaking our truth. The condition we have is not the same as AGP. Our needs and wants are different than those of AGP males. Evidence about the different types of GD needs to be brought back into the system of care and into public discussion. The abuse we have experienced in the community by those with AGP or by those who are simply uninformed about what's going on, so colluding with the AGP narrative, need to be addressed. Trans men with homosexual GD want the narrative corrected. We have a different kind of gender dysphoria and have different needs than the AGP males. We want our voices heard. We hope that trans women with homosexual GD will join us. We hope that AGP transsexuals who are ethical will also join us. This whole final section is implying that trans men like Buck Angel are being silenced. Yeah. 
Buck Angel must feel very silenced. I mean, he's a man who constantly appears in numerous headlines and productions and TV shows and porn programs. Also helped found several organizations that clearly signed this letter. Is also constantly being interviewed and being platformed on numerous different new organizations and channels. And also had the ability to write this letter and get people to read it and talk about it as is evidenced by the very fact that I'm making this video. Yeah, he sounds very silenced. This section also accuses trans women of abusing trans men, yet it never actually cites any specific examples of this, outside of what I've already proven are false, generalized accusations leveled against the trans women community. They also repeatedly throughout the letter misgender trans women as AGP males, misgendering being a practice that they, as trans men, know is at the very least disrespectful and can also lead to direct harmful mental health effects on any trans person. But also using this idea of AGP males again implies deceitfulness, that trans women are actually just men lying to you, that we're trying to pretend to be women for our own gain. Further, the letter ends on this implication that autogynophilic trans women, in their words, aren't even ethical, that we're inherently evil. It's plain and simple vilification, and it's quite disgusting and awful. And yet, it's not even the worst part about this letter. This letter is a public document of trans people disowning and pushing down other trans people. And it's trying to imply that the people and movement behind this letter is bigger than it actually is. The whole document, from its very title of Trans Men Fight Back, is trying to make this implication that all trans men are against trans women. And the fact that it was signed by Buck Angel, a famously known trans man, along with four other public-facing trans men who helped found transphobic groups Gender Dysphoria Alliance Canada and Trey Voices, helps to reinforce this implication. The signature section also ends on the line, quote, along with those who don't wish to be named. Which could be true, there could be other trans men who wish to sign the document, but given the rest of this document, I'm more inclined to believe that it's meant to manipulatively imply that there could be dozens more trans men who could have signed, but were just too terrified of the trans women agenda to sign the document. When in reality, there probably may have been one or two more trans men. Or it could be that there actually were more trans men, but they were simply aware of the pushback and accountability that they would have to face by actually having to put their name on a document so transparently harmful and transphobic. But regardless, this letter's intention was to create the implication of the entire trans men community being against trans women. And that's the exact narrative that anti-trans hate groups like TERFs want to see and weaponize against trans people and trans women specifically. Now, I've already made several videos on TERFs, including an introductory one, so if you don't know what TERFs are, you can go check out that video and it'll give you a good idea. But TERFs, sometimes referred to as gender critical feminists, heavy air quotes on the feminists there, are an ideological movement that dogmatically attacks the transgender community, with everything from just transphobic rhetoric, to support of the growing amount of anti-trans legislation across the United States and the United Kingdom, with misinformation, to online harassment, to support of anti-trans legal battles like one where a judge effectively blocked the usage of life-saving trans-affirming healthcare for transgender minors in the UK, and Buck Angel's letter directly dovetails perfectly with their narratives against trans women. Like the letter says, TERFs also inherently believe that trans women are deceptive and evil. That we're just men trying to hurt women, and we're trying to gain access to women's spaces by taking on the facade of womanhood, and going to things like bathrooms in order to assault and attack cisgender women. Also like the letter, TERFs also believe that trans women bodies are inherently sexual as well. That the very sight of a trans woman is tantamount to involving them in a sexual act. And I talked about that in my Kink at Pride video, where I showed that TERFs argue that trans women simply being in public was tantamount to trying to involve others in a sexual fetish. Even further, just like the letter, TERFs also try to push this idea of autogynophilia. We see this in two of the most prominent and popular anti-transgender TERF books written today, one by Abigail Schreer and one by Helen Boyce. They both cite the inaccurate autogynophilic theory in order to justify their transphobic narratives against trans people. Even further, TERFs produce other transphobic theories like rapid onset gender dysphoria, which leads to the implication that trans women are trying to trans the children, and specifically young girls, and force irreversible surgeries upon them. Which, by the way, no trans person, trans woman, or a trans man, or even a healthcare provider is actually trying to do. But it's just bunk science that TERFs are trying to push. In fact, the only justification for rapid onset gender dysphoria was a single study that was conducted by surveying parents on websites for parents who believe in rapid onset gender dysphoria. That's like someone trying to figure out how many people in the world like Star Trek by only asking people who are at a Star Trek convention. Of course, the answer that you're most likely going to get is yes. But again, we also see that this theory of rapid onset gender dysphoria was alluded to within the letter that I've been talking about this whole video. And it's also endorsed on the Gender Dysphoria Alliance of Canada website. 
So we can see that these ideas that these trans men are trying to push dovetail perfectly with what TERFs are trying to push to try to harm the trans women community. And by the way, this is not simply TERFs co-opting this transphobic narrative that Buck Angel and his groups are trying to produce. No, this is a coordinated effort between them. If you want proof of that, look no further than the fact that the signees of this letter, as well as Gender Dysphoria Alliance of Canada, also worked with the WOLF, a TERF group here in the United States, in order to sign a letter to the United Nations that pushed these same exact transphobic nonsense ideas. This is a fact, by the way, that these groups proudly display on their website that they worked together to try to vilify trans women and the trans community as a whole, to try to argue that trans women are deceitful, manipulative, and intentionally violent, trying to hurt trans men, citation needed, children, citation needed, and women, citation needed. And by the way, this usage of transphobic misinformation and bunk science isn't just between trans men and TERFs, but is constantly wielded by anti-transgender groups to further their narrative. We can easily see an example of this, for example, with how the aforementioned Dr. Ray Blanchard has consistently worked with and been platformed by white supremacists in recent years, or how similarly prominent TERFs have done much the same. Now, that's a larger topic for another day, but it shows how this system of misinformation perpetuates itself by weaving itself into more overtly harmful ideologies when in fact, all of their arguments are rooted in bad science that perpetuates transphobia, sexism, and homophobia. And they do all this because their goal is to try to stop the further public acceptance and understanding of real science that supports trans folks. That leads to us to be able to live happier and healthier lives, free of discrimination and stigmatization, and to be able to have access to better healthcare and basic human rights. But. That all being said, don't get me wrong. There's an element of me that understands why they're doing this. TERFs are often women, and trans men are obviously trans men. They're part of the trans community. And as a woman and a trans person myself, I know the harassment and bigotry they probably face for those identities. Believe me, I get a lot of it myself every single day. And as I discussed in my video on TERFs, TERFs often attack trans women out of a place of trauma that they displace on to trans women. Similarly, Buck Angel and the signees of this letter have done much the same, having been told their entire lives to conceptualize themselves as mentally ill by all of society and even professional medical experts in their life from the very moment that they learned that they were trans. As I said before, it's really hard to break narratives of yourself that you've been told to believe your whole life, no matter how much proof that you're given that it's wrong. So while I disagree with Buck, he has every right to exist as he does, and I will always respect his identity and pronouns as a man because that's what he is. Yet what trans people are not is an ideology. Buck Angel's ideology, as well as the other people that signed this letter, is harmful and wrong. Similarly, TERFs are not something that you are inherently, but it is a belief that is built up and reinforced with misinformation like that spread in this letter and by TERF groups. And TERFs are inherently harmful from their very base ideology. Both of these groups attack trans women in an attempt to justify their own pain and stigmatization. And as a result, my sympathy stops the moment they wield their pain not at those who perpetuate the harm, those in power, or at the systems in place that push misogyny or transphobia, but instead try to feel a sense of control and purpose by beating up a community weaker and more vulnerable than they are. That is where my sympathy stops and my anger begins. I want to end this on a positive note instead of the note that I just said there. Because all too often, it gets extremely easy to end on that note of, oh God, look how horrible this is. I'm angry, I'm pissed off. But I want you, dear viewer, to keep this in mind. The framing of this letter may be that trans men are against trans women. That's the impression that it wants to give, but it's a lie. I can't speak for trans men, but I can tell you this. As someone who has worked as a trans advocate for many years, over those years, I have consistently seen numerous trans men and women and non-binary folks working together as a community to not only protect ourselves and the trans community, but in coalition with others, working with true feminist organizations that denounce TERFs and fight for the rights of women, trans or not, as well as other minority groups as well, to try to help the rights of all people. And if you want proof of that, I can tell you this. Buck Angel's letter was publicly signed by five trans men. Yet, there is a petition signed by literally 675 trans men, at least that's the number at the time of this recording, that directly denounce Buck Angel's letter. 
this proves that Buck Angel does not speak for all or even most trans men. And I have the link to that letter below if you wish to sign it. Similarly, when JK Rowling came out in support of hateful turf groups, other authors like Stephen King, Neil Gaiman, Margaret Atwood, and so, so many others came out in support of the trans community. And for my own part, I do know that cis women and trans men also face battles that I, as a non-binary but femininely presenting trans person, do not face. And I will always do what I can, often imperfectly but earnestly, to be here as an ally for those fights for them as best I can. And I know many trans women do exactly the same. Because, you see, at the end of the day, no matter how vocal or powerful terse or transphobic groups like the signings of this letter are, they really are truly small. The folks that care about each other, that understand and empathize and listen to each other, well, we are Legion. everyone thank you so much for watching this video i hope it was helpful and informative i know it was a lot of like kind of dry history and academia but i hope that it was in at least some way um informative to all of you um like i said if you are a trans man and wish to sign that letter um that i mentioned i have the link down below i also have links to other information about autogynophilia written by the wonderful julia serrano as well as other um articles and information that uh kind of dovetail with the discussion that we've been having here in this video so i highly recommend that all of you go check out uh those links and videos down below if you wish to further understand because this was meant more as an overview. But beyond all of that, I just wish to thank you all so much for watching this video. Don't forget to help support me on Patreon. Don't forget to subscribe and hit the like button, all that stuff. But beyond all of that, I just hope that you, as always, live long and prosper. Patreon, the final frontier. These are the names of the patrons who help me explore strange new videos, seek out new topics, and boldly go where no YouTuber has gone before. Morgan, the Pirate Queen, Joe Herman Holt, Miranda Janelle, Eli Berg Moss, Liz Lee Roberts, Kathleen LaBeth, Ashley Allen, Bo Kikio, D. Cassowary, Stephen Kleinard, Jem Shin, Alex Miller, Ish the Mad, Randy Thompson, Wellington Marcus, Boyd and Mary Beth Earl, Man Chooses, A Slave Obeys, Base, Mary Mello, April Struck, Joseph Dewey, Felicia Toast, Bush, James Krivda, Barbara Ruski, Dominic Noble, Ulia Kai Gooch, Stefan Shuthart, Buttonier, Mina Carroll, Jessica Wright, Peter Landers, Jared Johnson, Bar Rangito, John Steele, Barbara Heelchuk, Celestial Dawn, Geek Filter, John Weatherby, Janie Packard, Pissed and Twisted Garage, Melinda Walters, Eva Keneva, Sky Dodo, Ulysses the Pagan, W. Randy E.D., Meadow Whisper, Beatrix Purvis, Alex Owen, Lysa, Keith Briggs, Tiffany Danger, Jedi Indiana Jones, Gretchen Badger, Flynn, Odd, Just Odd, Lamia, Amelia Loomis, Maggie the Goblin, Kayliss, William Stewart, Chloe Dollar, Sarah Byston, Jessica Chapman, Noble Monster Comics, Andrew Lamoureux, Mary Mack, Nathan Steele, Jacob Tovar, Laura Demero, Heuresis, Jason Knott, The Author 13, Sean Piper, Sky Skinner, Polly Mina, Troy Stahl, Lily, Maeve Munir Online, Strawberry Pup Tart, Andrew K, Nikki Gordon Bloomfield, Mountain Harpy, Shrib Machine Berlin, Amanda Roni Adania, Angie Push, Alan Badapple, Zone One Librarian, Michael Godey, Jenny Marble, Pasty, Michael Hardy Burr, Philip Hawkins, Andrew H., Mark Brown, There's My Shoulder, Corey and Vale, Honkinen. I love you all. Thank you all so much for being wonderful and supporting me doing this. I cannot thank you enough.